Our, our first panel this morning is going to be on the importance of technology and innovation for our economic future. The panel moderator is a fellow named Joe Parrish. I've had the privilege of working with Joe for a while now. Uh, Joe is the NASA Deputy Chief Technologist. He comes to NASA headquarters from the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California. And he also, before coming to NASA, worked in the private sector and has a, at least one payload aboard the International Space Station. Uh, I also know it's a privilege for Joe to be here today because I like airplanes, Joe loves airplanes. Uh, Joe is an accomplished private pilot. He flies an airplane that's very odd looking. It has a propeller in the back of it. And I've been uh, to airports with Joe. He's a kid in the candy shop and I know that the Museum of Flight is an awesome place to visit. Again, the exhibits here are amazing. They've got the history of flight from the beginning to the present to the future, and uh, it's just a great place to be uh, having our future form. And with that, I'll turn it over to Joe Parrish. Great, thanks very much, David. Well, it, it, is, uh, it is wonderful to be here this morning with, with you all. Um, just as Lori gave her, her shout out to, to Bill Nye, um, I, I'd like to give a shout out to my, my twin brother, Jerry, who is sitting in the front row there. Um, Jerry actually is the person who built that funny looking plane that uh, David mentioned. And he built that plane here, here in Seattle, right across the runway from where we are now in a little hangar over on the other side of, uh, of Boeing Field. So thrill, thrill for me to have my brother here. He built a very innovative airplane and then we share that plane now and uh, it helps to fuel my, my enthusiasm for flight and, uh, and moving on into all of aerospace and, and the space program. So thanks for, uh, thanks for Jerry for being here. Um, also wanted to thank Doug King and the, and the rest of the staff at the Museum of Flight for their incredibly warm welcome to us uh, and to allow us to talk today about innovation and technology. And we have a terrific panel here. Uh, my, my colleagues, Bob Pierce from NASA, Christy Morganson from the University of Washington, Roger Myers from Aerojet, and Ed Lazowska from University of Washington have um, a fantastic a plethora of experiences and, and ideas about innovation that they're going to be sharing with us this morning. Um, the way we thought we would construct this uh, next little bit more than an hour that we'll be spending talking about innovation is uh, each of us, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about innovation from our, our own perspectives, and then we were we had a, a sort of overarching question that we posed to each other to talk about, and those are what, what are the major technology challenges that we're facing now? How do we see uh, our, our technological future evolving? And where do we think we're going to be in 20 years in, in addressing those technology challenges? And what role might innovation play in that? So you'll hear us talk a little bit about our own perspectives on, on innovation, and then we'll talk and address that particular question. The other thing that I was going to do is, um, rather than, than hit you with a barrage of, of introductions of my very accomplished colleagues, I was going to do them sort of one at a time. So I, I was going to make a couple of short remarks first and then introduce Bob and then we'll move, move ourselves across the, the row. So thanks very much again and uh, really looking forward to, to this discussion and looking forward to having a dialogue with you. So I hope that as we talk, you'll be thinking about questions that you'd like to ask us and uh, we'll take them uh, and, uh, and really start to, to, to engage and think about innovation and technology. So a couple of thoughts. And I've been thinking a little bit about, you know, what is the meaning and what is the significance of, of technology and, and innovation? And I have, a, I have a somewhat unconventional definition of what innovation actually is. I, I think that innovation is the constructive rejection of the status quo. And what I mean when I say cons the constructive rejection of the status quo is if you're satisfied, and Lori, Lori started to talk about this a little bit in her remarks, if you're satisfied with the status quo, you're not an innovator. Right? You're okay with um, your television set being almost two feet deep and weighing 200 pounds and, and uh, carving big holes in your, in your shag carpeting in your living room. Uh, if you're satisfied with when a question comes up in your conversation to walk over to the Encyclopedia Britannica and try to find which of those 30 volumes has the answer for you and bring, bring that back to the discussion, then you're not an innovator. You're, you're OK with the status quo. And thankfully, we as a nation, um, we're not satisfied with the status quo. We never are, and we always want more. 
We want to um, have the ability to pull from our pockets this little gadget that not only allows us to talk to anyone on the planet practically, to answer practically any question that one might pose. Now we don't even have to type in that question. We can, we can talk to that little gadget. Imagine, imagine what that means. Imagine how incomprehensible that is to somebody 100 years ago, 50 years ago, even 25 years ago to be able to do that. Um, it's wonderful to be here in, in Seattle one of really the hotbeds of, of innovation in our nation. And that is not a, a new thing, starting uh, you know, with, with the, the innovations that Boeing has made to make the United States the world leader in aviation, uh, with Microsoft, and even with Starbucks. I, I, I personally think that the drive-through Starbucks is the, the pinnacle of human achievement. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not sure that we can really go much, much further than that, so th thanks to Seattle for, for, for fostering innovation for the rest of us in, in, the, in the country and in the world. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that um, investments, you, you all are taxpayers, and you are investing in our future with your tax dollars. And it's easy for some to ask the question, unfortunately, there, none, of, none of the people who ask this question are sitting in this audience, because you guys already get the answer, but some people ask, why, why are we taking these dollars, why are we taking these precious tax dollars and firing them off into space? And to that, I, I respond, you know what, we're not actually packaging up a bunch of dollar bills into the nose cone of a rocket and firing it onto Mars to be spent by Martians on, on that planet. And we're not doing that, actually. We're actually spending that money on planet Earth, and in the process of developing the systems that we do send to Mars and to Jupiter and to Saturn and beyond, we're enabling things here on planet Earth. We're spending that money on Earth. We're creating high technology jobs that in turn inspire new ideas and create new ecosystems of supporting companies. Think of all the companies that support Boeing as, as tier providers. Think of all the companies that are going to support this burgeoning commercial launch industry that NASA is helping to kick off. So what is it about NASA and what, what, how does innovation actually happen at NASA? Uh, as Lori mentioned in her opening remarks, this is kind of a transformational period in, in NASA. We're ending the space shuttle program, and we're embarking on an ambitious new plan to send humans to explore beyond Earth orbit, to the moon, to asteroids, and ultimately onto Mars. Uh, in order to do that, we're asking our, our people uh, at NASA to create incredible things. Uh, and in order to create these incredible innovations, we believe that we need to create an environment of innovation within NASA to inspire those innovative products. So we do that in, in a variety of ways. Number one, we um, are really keeping our eyes open for broader societal benefits to the things that we develop. Now, you all have heard of things that we call spin-offs, where we develop a technology at NASA, and we'll recognize that that technology has applications beyond just the, the NASA ecosystem, and we look for ways to, to apply those technologies in the commercial sector or to, um, to help people all, all over the planet. And we're actually increasing our emphasis on our view toward broader societal benefits. We've also chosen to take unique new approaches to engaging with the most innovative thinkers uh, in, in the country and around the world by engaging them in ways that are not traditional. And the traditional ways that I'm referring to are like contracts that NASA would issue to an aerospace firm or a grant that they would make. We're looking at new ways of, of doing business. And one of the ways that we have chosen to do this is through prizes and challenges. And one of the wonderful things that we've just done this last year is we, NASA created a challenge called the Green Flight Challenge that was a prize for the highest performing small aircraft and we were asking for this to basically be a Prius in the sky, to get the equivalent fuel economy to what a, a Prius car gets on, on the ground. We wanted 200 passenger miles per gallon from this aircraft. And this year in, in California, we actually had two aircraft. The, 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 the one that finished in second place got 385 passenger miles per gallon. And the winner got 413 passenger miles per gallon from an airplane. That is astonishing, and it's nothing that we could have ever imagined in the past, and it was through competition. We issued a prize to the winner, and the competitors sunk much, much more than NASA gave out in that prize to develop the aircraft that competed in the competition. So 
We inspired new things, new technologies, new innovations, and we went about it in a way that was vastly different than the way that NASA has done things in the past. And we see more and more of that coming in the future. Let me close my, my comments a little bit uh, in discussing, discussing today's technology challenges. One thing that, I, that, that strikes me is that technology goes at a pace that we can't predict. Unfortunately, it would be wonderful if we could predict these things, but we can't. And I'm struck by things that have gone at a much faster pace than we could have ever imagined. Think, think of cell phones and, and computers as things that we could have never imagined how quickly they evolved. Um, technologies associated with transportation and, and the environment are evolving quickly. Um, we're, we're looking to having wind power, solar power, other methods of non-polluting power and the technology that's necessary to make those cost effective with the higher polluting approaches, those are evolving on, on, a, on a very rapid and increasing pace. And then, you know, let's, let's be honest. Uh, I think that the evolution, the pace of technology development in some segments of the aerospace sector have actually gone slower than we imagined, right? Who, who would have thought in July of 1969 that we would be 42 years later and not have gone any farther than the moon? Um, I think people who were watching the, the moon landing on, on that day would be very disappointed that fast forward 40 years and that's really as far as we've gone. So we have more work to do and we think at NASA very hard about this problem and think about how we can accelerate the pace so that the pace that we make progress in aerospace applications for both aeronautics and space, how do we bring that pace up to the pace that we've seen in the computer, consumer products industry, energy, and transportation industries? So there's a, there's a, a variety of things in play right now and it's a very, very exciting time to, to be alive and be participating. So those are just some thoughts that I wanted to, to kick open the, the discussion with. And so with, with that thought, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Mr. Robert Pierce. Bob is, uh, he is our vision guy in aeronautics. He is, he is the director for, for strategy, architecture, and analysis in the Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate, which is one of three directorates that we have at NASA, the other two being science and human exploration and operations. Bob plans the strategy, the look forward for what we're doing in aeronautics, trying to make aviation more fuel efficient, more uh, noise, uh, sense, more, more lower noise capabilities, increasing our ability to manage traffic as we get more populated in the United States and air traffic starts to increase, and how to do that in, in a safe and effective manner. That's Bob's job. And um, he's a, a fascinating guy. I asked actually all of our panelists to give me a little sort of personal tidbit about themselves to, to make this a little bit more, more human because the resumes are all incredible. Um, Bob is, is a runner and actually just, just uh, did his first half marathon this year. And so congratulations to Bob on, on uh, 13 tough miles. And uh, he's going to talk with us a little bit about innovation in aeronautics and talk a little bit more about how he views the future as we move forward. So please welcome Bob Pierce. Thank, Thank you, Joe. And it's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure and a real honor to, to be here at the Museum of Flight. And, and I certainly plan on taking a, taking a walk around and really enjoying the, the exhibits after, after this is completed. And, and I actually want to ask you guys to do something as well on, on, an, on a walk that uh, we often take. I want you to do something very specific. So the next time you walk onto an airplane, um, on the next trip you're going to take, I want you to look around a little bit. And, and so first when you go in and take a look to the left and you, and you look in, into the cockpit and you see those glass displays, those, a lot of those originally, uh, the, the functionality in those displays originally pioneered by NASA. If you, look, if you were able to look behind those glass displays at the digital flight controls that many airplanes have, the, the, the nervous system of an airplane that was originally pioneered by NASA. If you actually look at the, the pilots interacting together, that crew, crew resource management as we call it, again, something that, that, that NASA pioneered those human factors in order to improve safety. And then when you turn and you go down into the airplane and you see all those really tight, cramped, uncomfortable seats, yeah, yeah, that's not NASA. Don't, yeah, that's not NASA, okay. <laughs> but, but if you kind of look, peered over those seats, out the window and onto the wing, and if you looked at the cross section of that wing, most, most of the modern wings are supercritical airfoils, again, pioneered by NASA. You look at the winglets that many, you know, the, the little wings that stick up at the end of the wing, um, 
that many airplanes have, again, pioneered by NASA. If you, the, the overall shape of the airplane called the area rule, um, if, you, if you were able to look into the engine, the low emission combustors that, that, that efficiently burn the fuel but, but emit uh, as, as few um, um, of the, the, bad, the bad emissions as possible. If you look at the lightweight, uh, um, high temperature alloys that are in that engine and allow that core, the core of the engine to be as small as possible so we get the largest bypass so the fan can be um, push as much air as possible, make the, make the engine as efficient as possible. Again, uh, NASA, the shape of many of the components inside the engine to allow a really optimal balance between the efficiency of that engine and the noise characteristics. Again, NASA, you know, the, the, if you look at the latest designs, if, you know, when, you, when, you, when I drove in, you see the 787 parked out there, just a magnificent Boeing airplane. And, you know, half of that airplane, 50% of that airplane is composite materials. NASA spent 30 years working through the, all of the issues associated with composite materials so that we could safely apply them in a very efficient way. If you look at the engine, at the back of that engine, you see, you know, this kind of scalloped shape. It's the, there's a Chevron, it's a Chevron nozzle. It helps in the mixing of the jet flow to, to reduce the overall jet noise that comes off the airplane. So, and all of that, all of that innovation, we build that into tools, into CFD tools, into structural design tools and so forth, and all of those are available to the industry, and those tools get used to build those, those modern airplanes. So when you walk, and in fact, this is a, Na, a, a Boeing term, but when Boeing talks about it, they say it's the NASA DNA that's in every airplane. And so I worked, walked through a commercial airplane, but you could, I could do the same thing for a military airplane, you could do the same thing for a general aviation airplane, um, for helicopters and so forth. The, the DNA of all of those, everything that flies started at NASA. And so we're very proud of that and we're really proud of that tradition. Let me talk just a minute about, you know, why do we care? Why is that so important? Why is this an economic engine? And, and if you look at aviation, that is, it is absolutely the safest, high speed global mobility provider. It is what we use and there's no substitute. Today, domestically, if you look at an annual basis, we have 600 million passengers that fly on 200 million, uh, 200 million, I'm sorry, 20 million flights, totaling about 600 billion revenue passenger miles annually. We do all of that, all that flying for one half of 1% of GDP. It is an efficient, efficient industry. But if you look at that, and if you look at what's the impact on our economy, all of the, you know, getting the people where they need to go, the goods where they need to go, the, 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 the industries that absolutely require that capability, and now the impact, the benefit is, is over 5% of GB, GDP. So it's a big multiplier, it's a big impact. And, and I think if you, if you look at aviation, if you look at the, those industries, it, and especially if you look at the manufacturing, let's just look at manufacturing for a second. It, it's incredible that, now just commercial transport, I'm not, not all of aviation, commercial transport, 20 year, if you look at, take a 20 year view of, of the commercial industry, $4 trillion market. It's a global market, huge growth in, in the Asia Pacific region and so forth. And so we enjoy, because of Boeing and, and because of the thousands of, of, of companies that contribute to those airplanes, we enjoy a $40 billion annual uh, balance of trade in airplanes. And of course, Boeing is having record sales, and, you probably, and everybody around here I'm sure knows that. Uh, you look at the newspapers, the 777, the 737 MAX and so forth. You look at 737 Silver Max, why is that so important? Why, why is that? Because if you look, even though it, the airlines provide so much benefit, not everything is good news, right? They're, the cost of fuel has risen by a factor of six in the last 20 years. As a function of the, 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 the cost that the airlines pay, it's gone from about a quarter. They used to pay about a quarter of their total cost for fuel, now they're a half. Now, that, that's really tough to manage an increase like that, but you can also see fuel went up by a factor of six, but that only went up by a factor of, of, of two. And the reason is those airplanes have gotten a lot more efficient. And so the, 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 the need for new airplanes, the need to continue to push that, that envelope is, is, is there, is gonna continue. But $4 trillion, $4 trillion market attracts attention. So now you have Embraer from, from Brazil, you have, you have Bombardier from Canada that, are, that have pioneered in the regional jet market, and now they want to get into the, the larger, larger scale jets because they see that market and they see that there's an opportunity there. Obviously China and, and the COMAC is, is coming along as well. So there's a lot of, of competition com coming, but this is exactly the type of industry that the U.S. needs to be successful in. 
the scale, the market, as I just talked about. But this, this drives manufacturing and drives employment. This is, these are not, you know, there's, there's some industries in, in IT and other places where you get a lot of market, but it doesn't employ a lot of people. This employs a lot of people. You look at the scope of technology. It, it needs every bit of technology from every corner that you, that you can imagine. But most importantly, I'll get to one of Joey's points. What are, what are the tech challenges? One of the really critical things, one of the things Boeing does well, but we as a nation need to do better, is integration. It takes incredible software, incredible hardware, and the people. Sometimes we, we forget that, that the person, the person that operates the airplane, the person that operates their transportation system is part of that system, and all three need to work together flawlessly to make sure it's robust, to make sure it's resilient, to make sure it's perfectly safe. This industry has to be safe. So it puts requirements that, that perhaps other industries don't always put on it. So the, these, these so-called human cyber physical systems, the, the integration around that, that is, I think, one of the premier technical challenges of the 21st century. It is what we as a nation have to be the best at. We've got to make these things work from the beginning, work right, make sure they're robust, make sure they're safe, and that is going to be the high ground for, I think, for the next, for the next several decades. Okay, let's take a look at, a quick look at the future. So when, we, when, when NASA looks at this, of course, we don't, we're not looking at current vehicles. We're trying to look at a generation or two. We're trying to look at where are things going. So we, we put things in sort of generational terms. When we look out a couple generations, we're looking at, at le orders of magnitude improvement. Of, of in noise and efficiencies and so forth. We want to make big strides, okay? And the questions, and so there's a lot of technologies that go into trying to make those things happen. And I have numbers, I'll, in, in the interest of time, I won't go through the kind of numbers we're looking at, but we, but we look at noise, we look at emissions, we look at efficiencies and so forth, trying to make those most much better. So one of, some of the things we're looking at is, when does the current configurations, the tube and wings that we're so used to looking at on the runway and you're so used to getting onto, when does that have to change because we can't eke any more efficiency out of that kind of configuration? So we're looking today at, at, at hybrid wing bodies, the, you know, kind of these bat wing type, type airplanes, airplanes where the, the wings sort of wrap back on, it, on themselves in order to get very high aspect ratios. Um, strut brace wings that are, that are very long and we, and, we, and we kind of use braces to make sure that those very long wings can, can operate at the kinds of Mach numbers and, and, and um, operating conditions we're looking at. So, so that's one of, the, that's another technical challenge is how do, how do you make that transition from today's very mature and, and understood configuration to a configuration that's very different but that you have to go to if you're going to continue to make the kind of strides we want to make. So that's another big technical challenge, and propulsion is the same. At some point, we're, we're looking at hybrid electric propulsion, distributed electric propulsion, and so forth, so another big, big technical challenge for the future. Let's just broaden the aperture a little bit and, and look beyond just commercial um, air transportation. Let's look at UAS, so unmanned aircraft systems. The military has, has pioneered these systems, and they, and they provide um, uh, the, the kinds of, the kinds of uh, um, surveillance and other other missions that the, the military needs, but today they can't fl they can't fly in the airspace system. They can't fly where, except on a on a on a, um, a special exception basis, they can't fly when in in the same airspace that that pilot air, um, aircraft fly. NASA is taking that challenge on, looking at the the issues with respect to the the, the pilot. You know, the pilot sits on the ground for uh, for the UAS at least currently. At some point, maybe it won't be a pilot. NASA but what's Didn't I just say that? <laughs> okay. Whoa. Didn't I just say that? We're having technical difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, something. <laughs> yeah. Please 
please, please bear with Nothing us. Nothing can right. go wrong with these drone aircraft. Don't you worry. <laughs> 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 That's why they're not actually. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So, sounds like we're back online. We just we just lost control of the UAS for just a moment. <laughs> <laughs> we now we now have it back. NASA's going to fix that problem. Okay. <laughs> so, sounds like we're back online. We just uh. Are we, uh, do Derek? Try again. Derek, are we back? Okay. So we're so so NASA is working on the on the problems of actually integrating the UAS into the national airspace. So so the separation assurance requirements we have to make sure they don't run into other airplanes. We have to make sure the pilots actually have situational awareness. We have to know how to certify these things. So. So NASA is working on that, but you can imagine the kinds of, we, I mean, in some ways it's hard to imagine really what all the applications are. Some of the initial applications for, for search and rescue, for firefighting, for, for law enforcement and so forth. But, but, but if you think long term, think about what's coming, you know, you know Joe talked about, you know, innovation in the economy. You know, imagine, you know, imagine when, when, you know, already the, you know, if you look at the way Packages are distributed. You know that the whole cargo um, industry. You know, UPS and FedEx operate a very distributed small aircraft network. Um, th those all require pilots. Those all those all have a significant cost. If you could take the pilot station out, if you could put more packages into one of those small airplanes, you could get better distribution. And then you know, look at innovations outside of aviation. Look at 3D printing, right? So 3D printing, you start to build up parts and 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 products. You print them on this on these 3D printers. It's you know it just lays the the materials um, out just as in a, in a normal printer, except now you get a 3D object. This this could lead to a, a revolution in the distribution of manufacturing um, capabilities on a geographic basis. And wouldn't it be great to have UASs that could support that kind of a, 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 a distributed uh, manufacturing base? Look at the future of energy when energy becomes much more distributed uh, part of the infrastructure millions of uh, wind turbines and and millions of, of rooftop uh, solar panels what if you had UASs that could robotically do the maintenance on on these these millions of distributed systems that provide energy for us so you can think of, of all those possibilities and I'll just add one one last piece I didn't mention but one of the one of the issues we've got in the air, air, air transportation system is we're losing the short haul part of it, because of the, you know, if you look at more or less less than 500 miles, it's dropping off precipitously. People don't use air transportation as much in that domain, partly because of the, the hassle of getting through the airport and so forth. But imagine, now, now think of, of the, the, the airplanes that, that Joe just talked about, these that, that, were, that were flown in the Green Aviation Challenge. Here's a small airplane, can do twice what a Prius, can do four times the energy efficiency of a 787, as a matter of fact. Now, if, if you could get these, if you could get these these small aircraft to operate into into and out of small airports and provide those, that short haul capability, it'd be a real step forward. What's one of the big impediments? One of the big impediments is you either would have to today you'd have to either hire a pilot, really expensive, or you'd have to be a pilot. And you know, so people like Joe would would, would love that. But other, you know, lots of folks don't want to go through the expense of and and the and the learning curve of being a pilot. Well. Once we get the, the learning on the UAS, once we get more autonomy and, and automation, maybe these things don't have to be piloted. Maybe we can have the automation piloted. And so I know, I know what you're all thinking, that when you land, you're not going to get the, the pithy joke from the pilot. But we're going we're to get there. We are going to get there. It's going to be an acceptable part of how we do transportation, both on the ground and in the air. Autonomy is coming. So I think there's a bright future for aviation, a lot of innovation uh, left to be done, and NASA plans to be out in the, in the forefront of that. So thank you very much, and, and I look forward to taking your questions. Great. Th thank, thanks very much, Bob. You, you raised uh, so, so many fascinating points in, in, in your talk. And, uh, I think that one of, the, one of the most intriguing ones has to do with the, the way that humans and machines work with each other and how do we um, best affect control over these devices. And that's why uh, it's so wonderful to have uh, Dr. Christy Morganson following Bob's comments with, with her own. Christy 
her specialty is, in fact, guidance, navigation, and control, um, control of, of vehicles, human and autonomous systems. And this is her expertise area. And she is particularly well versed in the area of underwater vehicles and is going to talk probably about underwater vehicles and, and make a transition into aeronautical and space systems also in the, in the course of that discussion. So if you need, uh, need help making your, your robot swim straight, then Christy is, is the person for, for you. So thanks very much for Christy to be, for being here and uh, look forward to your comments. All right, well thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, so actually I wasn't gonna target my comments specifically at underwater vehicles, but I'm happy to answer any questions along those lines if people have them. And uh, just as a point of fact, Bob and I did not compare notes ahead of time, but a number <laughs> of my points are actually directly in line with his. Um, so what I wanted to do first was just say a few things about autonomous systems. I think that um, a lot of the future of technology is going to lie directly in line with autonomous systems and already does, um, probably in ways that are somewhat obvious in some senses to most people, but in other cases, um, you actually work with them every day and probably don't really think of them as autonomous systems. Uh, so some of, just uh, the big impact with them, uh, they're meant to be transformational in human perception and access, what can we can see and what we can do. So some of the, the big areas where they come into play, emergency response, and some of these have already been mentioned. So emergency response, so something like the, the nuclear reactor, um, disaster over in Japan, the oil rig uh, failure in the Gulf, uh, medical robotics, uh, environmental monitoring, so tracking fires and things like that, weather prediction, um, monitoring the ocean, that's actually where a bunch of my and many people's underwater vehicle applications come into play. Uh, exploration, so space exploration, um, exploration around the planet, exploration inside of the human beings, uh, and of course military action. Uh, so different kinds of uh, autonomous systems that come up, so there's the vehicle side of things, and on, on that uh, scale we have vehicles that range from tethered, so things that went down and explored the Titanic and go down and explore uh, many other things underwater in space. Uh, that allows you to have access to power, unlimited communication, data transfer, things like that, um, and access to an operator directly. Uh, all the way to things that are completely untethered, so that would be something like your rover on Mars or these um, aerial vehicles, although sometimes you can tether some of them if you want to be a hobbyist and operate them without a COA. Um, we can't do that at the university unless they're tethered. Uh, there's differences between whether they're fully autonomous, so they don't have anybody directly operating them, to whether there's a, a remote uh, control device directly connected and the, there's a pilot running the vehicle. And often the pilot, uh, particularly in like emergency response situations, they're actually backed up by two or three other people. So one of our big challenges right now is that a single autonomous vehicle may require anywhere from two to five or more um, people to make it fully uh, operational and safe, according to current standards. Uh, we're looking at situations where we have either single autonomous vehicles, single autonomous systems, all the way up to groups of them, um, where we're trying to uh, expand the capabilities, and again, all kinds of different regimes with them. Um, so some of our key technological challenges with these systems, the limited power, so again, if you don't have a tether to the vehicle, um, you have to work with whatever's on board the vehicle, so you have to have effective battery capabilities. Um, some of the appeal of the underwater gliders that I work with is they have a battery pack on board that allows them to operate for six to nine months with no servicing, depending on the particular battery. Um, how do you deal with this human and autonomy integration? Um, so depending on what kind of regime you're working in, you might be able to drive a vehicle directly and have um, a, a remote operated situation, or if you have the rover out on Mars, it takes you know, minutes just to even send a signal out to them, much less get data back. And you, you know, over that kind of a channel, you're, you're not sending a lot um, of information very quickly. Uh, dealing with the, the actual interface between the human and an autonomous system, um, where, you know, I'm gonna generically say that autonomous system might be something like a prosthetic device. There's a lot of work being done right now um, trying to further uh, human augmentation in the sense of, you know, not trying to necessarily make like, you know, the Borg from, Star Trek, but you know, trying to come up with better prosthetic devices for, say, um, people who've lost limbs or um, have medical conditions that prevent them from using their limbs. Um, so there's all kinds of things that come up there: trust between the devices, um, security of wireless transmission of information. Um, you know, how how are the devices perceived by by people? Safety, um, number of things along the lines there, uh, and dealing with the data transfer. 
Um, so some of the key enablers, I actually wanted to mention some of these because I think these are key things. Um, I think uh, getting the general population involved is like historically a huge impact on making progress. Uh, one point I really wanted to make is uh, what we often see or market as games and toys are in fact the steps to technological advances. I mean, this goes all the way down to you know babies. I have a one-year-old and you can watch him playing with blocks and he's figuring out how to manipulate the world around him. So what for him is a game is actually how he's gonna, I have no idea what he's going to build it. A little <laughs> scared about that actually. Um, but things like 3D printing, um, which may not be a phrase that's uh, familiar to everyone, but the maker technology. So there are these devices where you can print, as um, Bob mentioned, uh, a mechanism. You can also print cookie dough with them, and you know, bake cookies with your initials on the inside um, for very low cost. So, um, devices like that, getting them out to the general population and letting the population sort of drive where they go and how they're developed, that generally leads to low cost, um, high efficiency kinds of situations. Um, crowdsourcing the movie industry. Um, I would say that, you know, in 20 years, this is something we we're targeted to sort of look at. What do we think might be happening? I think that. James Cameron's vision of Avatar, while we might not do that specific kind of uh, application of you know, an actual genetically built second person, um, I think a lot of the things that you saw in that kind of movie are things that we will be seeing much more integrated into so to society in 20 years. So um, I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much, Christy. Uh, I, I uh, ne neglected to, to fill in the, the human element for Christy, although she's uh, alluded to some of them with the, the one-year-old, which is, must dominate your, your life. Uh, Christy's also an outdoor enthusiast, uh, scuba diver, bicyclist, and mountain climber who's climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. So very, very impressive. Although and I have to admit, I didn't make it to the top of Kilimanjaro. I got altitude sickness the last day. So. <laughs> I got to 16,000 feet. That's, that's pretty impressive. We have oxygen on when we're above 12,000 in the airplane, so that's, that's terrific. Okay, so um, let, let's move on, and, and um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Roger Myers. He is the Executive Director for Electric Propulsion and Integrated Systems at Aerojet, which is a, a company that develops propulsion systems, and, and Roger will, will uh, likely talk about this for many of NASA's missions, both human and, and robotic. Um, Roger is, he is also a forward thinker and, and has been responsible for strategic planning, develop, and production of next generation chemical and electric propulsion systems. Electric propulsion, for those of you who don't know, is sort of one of the next breakthrough technology areas for planetary exploration missions. And Roger is expert in that. He has a long history uh, in research with NASA and in, in academia at, at Princeton. Uh, he uh, and, and his wife live in, in Woodenville, which is wine country here in, in Seattle, uh, a fascinating place where, where they enjoy bird watching as, as their uh, in interaction with, with the outdoors. So please welcome Roger and really look forward to your comments on propulsion technologies and innovation and where we're going in that area. So good morning. So it's, it's really nice to be here. Uh, it was a pleasure to participate yesterday in the opening of the Charles Simone uh, New Space Gallery. So as uh, Joe said, uh, I was asked to comment on some of the transportation technologies. Uh, and I call it transportation as opposed to propulsion because it's not just about the rockets. It's also about the vehicles that are required to do this, to, to do the missions. Um, and so in, ad in addition to talking about the technologies, I want to talk a little bit about some programmatic challenges that we actually face. Uh, you know, what are the issues that we're really facing today? But I'll start with technology. So we heard today from Lori Garver about uh, the dramatic cost reductions that are necessary in space transportation. We, talked, we, we heard about the big rockets and how expensive they are. Uh, and if we're going to explore deep space, we have to get the cost down uh, if we, we want to go beyond low Earth orbit. And essentially, it's just saying that the cost of developing, building, operating, and maintaining the launch vehicles and infrastructure required for those launch vehicles, as well as all of the deep space systems, the habitats, the landers, the ascent vehicles, and all the exploration, uh, exploration equipment, 
within the budgets that we currently have is going to really have to change, we have to change our paradigm in the way that we do deep space exploration. And that's, that's not rocket science as much as I'd, I'd like it to be. Uh, it's really just basic physics and economics. We don't have the money to do all of the big rockets that we would really like to do. Uh, and so we need to think about doing deep space exploration differently. The key, the, the reason uh, that it takes so many of those big rockets is energy. Uh, going beyond low Earth orbit takes a lot of energy. There's a quote by a, a, a science fiction author that uh, if you get to low Earth orbit, you're halfway to any, anywhere in the solar system. That's only true if you don't want to land and you don't want to come home. So if you want to come home, if you want to do something there and you want to come home, it drops it to about a quarter or thereabouts of the energy. Is the energy going to low Earth orbit is only about a quarter of the total energy required to do those missions. So, so if we want to go do something cool on the surface of Mars, you, we have to invest in the in-space elements. It's, it's a requirement. You know, much as we make progress in our launch vehicles, uh, and reducing the cost of the launch vehicles, uh, we have to invest in, in deep space. So the reason for that is that today's propulsion systems, the in-space, uh, what, what's available for in-space propulsion, uh, are pretty inefficient. They're, they're not very high performance, and that means that you have to carry a huge amount of fuel. You have to launch a tremendous amount of propellant to get uh, beyond low Earth orbit. And that takes big, expensive, unique rockets to do that. And we have to change that paradigm. So if we're going to explore deep space, we need a balanced set of investments in both the launch architecture, the way that we launch uh, people and cargo, and also we need a parallel set of investments in deep space uh, transportation system technologies, deep space transportation architectures. As we heard earlier today, we're making huge progress in the launch arena. Uh, we're making investments in crew commercial crew transportation. The Sierra Nevada Dream Chaser program is a really cool program, using some green technologies uh, for in instead of the, the toxic rocket propellants. So making great progress in various areas. SpaceX is, is here. We'll hear from, from them later. And the SLS, it, which uh, Lori Garver talked about earlier, will enable uh, the Orion capsule to go beyond low Earth orbit. Uh, and that's a great step. But we need to take more than just the Orion capsule, right? It'd be kind of boring if the only thing that you had was the Orion capsule there, and it's, it's not, not all that big. So we also need to send food, water, habitats, rovers, ascent vehicles, all of that stuff that is needed to do those interesting missions that we want to do in an affordable manner. And affordability is really central to, it, it needs to be central to the way that we think about deep space exploration. We need to think about cargo, not just crew. Much as the human part of a mission is what excites us all, if we don't have useful tools for them to use, and food to eat, and oxygen to breathe, and the, the rockets to bring them back, uh, it's, it's not going to be, uh, an interesting mission. So it, if we separate cargo and crew in that manner, our, our studies show that you can really dramatically reduce the cost of deep space exploration because you can optimize the two transportation systems. You can do crew fast the way crews will want to go to Mars or to the, back to the moon or to asteroids or wherever they're, they end up going. And cargo can be pre-positioned. And it's really the same analogy, the, the way we do it on Earth right now. We don't have one transportation system. We heard about aircraft earlier. But we also have big cargo ships and we have uh, trains. And the, so the way that we think about transportation architectures really needs to move from the way we're currently thinking about deep exploration to a new paradigm if we are going to truly get the cost of deep space explorations down. The cool thing is that 
the basic technologies are pretty much there. We've been doing this for decades now, and we have a lot of the basic technologies. So if we started a program today using technologies that are very near to application, they're not ready yet, but they're very near to application, I think we can go to the moon, the asteroids, the Martian moons, and the surface of Mars, and do it affordably. Specifically, if we use a combination of commercial crew, the SLS, the MPCV, modular cryogenic stages for crew transport, so those are the elements of the crew transport, and we use realistic high power solar electric propulsion for pre-positioning cargo at our destinations, I think we can implement an affordable, robust transportation system for space exploration. And when I say transportation system, this isn't just to go to Mars. This is a system that would, uh, that would be multifunctional, go, go to all the destinations. It's another way that you get the cost down, is that you have systems which are used for multiple purposes by multiple markets. It's a very important way to distribute fixed costs, for example. So technologically, this seems doable, and it seems affordable to us if we do it right. But we have programmatic challenges, and this is the second part. So our biggest programmatic challenge is sustaining a technology program that sees new developments through to application. We have a lot of basic technologies. Uh, the electric propulsion systems have been around for a long time. Uh, cryogenic rockets have been around for a long time. There are some new innovations that we need in long-term cryo storage, high power solar arrays, uh, very high power solar arrays. There's some new technologies like that that, that we do, do need. But pretty much, we're, we're pretty much there from a basic technology perspective. Solar arrays exist today. Cryogenic rockets exist today. They need to be engineered. But it's not new technology, so to speak. But what we, don't, what we have not done is validated them. We have not transitioned them, and Lori Garver talked earlier today about transitioning technology. And that is, it's an expensive process, but making sure that we can actually use the technologies in the, with the appropriate risk profile is really what's, what I'm talking about when I say transition technologies to application. And we don't have a robust program now for technology transition. Uh, I've personally transitioned a lot of technologies uh, in the commercial sector uh, to, to space flight, several different uh, propulsion systems, including some electric propulsion systems. Uh, but uh, we need to take that next step with the larger missions that are, re larger systems that are required for human space exploration. So in summary, a lot of the technologies are there. We do need some key innovations, as I, as I mentioned, but what we're lacking more than anything is a robust transition to uh, application program, a, a sustained effort to take the technologies that we have and make them useful, show that we can use them. And I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks very much for your thoughts, Roger. I'd like to now uh, introduce, uh, la last but definitely not least, Dr. Ed Lazowska. Ed has the, the fantastic title of Bill and Melinda Gates Chair in Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington. And when I hear that title, I can't help but think that this, this, uh, this person has the opportunity to really think big thoughts and uh, think about the role of computers and information technologies and society as a whole. And that, in, in fact, is what Ed has, has dedicated himself to doing. Um, he does, he does a, a variety of things, both locally here and, and, uh, and across the country, including directing the University of Washington's eScience Institute, which is the organization that tries to spread computing technologies across the UW campus. He chairs the, the Computing Community Consortium, which is looking at addressing challenges in information technology across the, the 21st century. And he also has been involved in uh, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, uh, addressing a working group there, uh, helping, helping to chair a working group there on reviewing federal networking and information technology research and, and development. So 
Ed is your your person uh, number one. If your if your iPhone is crashed, I think Ed is the guy to to talk to to help get get that resolved. But really, Ed is Ed is the guy who's forecasting where we are going to be uh, in the middle of the 21st century, at the end of the 21st century, for information technology, and that is that is a wonderful space to to be in. So welcome, Ed, and we look forward to your comments. Well, thanks. It's great to be here. That's, of course, an introduction that one cannot possibly fulfill. But uh, I, I will say that almost everything has been said, so I'll at least attempt to repeat it quickly here. Um, it, it's important that computer science, information technology, is represented here today because really the two pillars of the technology economy in the Puget Sound region are aerospace and uh, computing information technology. And uh, this is a region that's really uh, contributed to making our nation a leader in, uh, in both of those areas. Uh, let me tie the two together by going back to 1969. You've, you've heard about Neil Armstrong and uh, uh, walking on the moon in 1969. There are a set of other important things that happened about 40 years ago in 1969. The uh, Mets won the World Series. There was uh, Woodstock. And uh, more germane than either of those, and no one remembers what happened at Woodstock anyway, is that the first packet of data flowed over ARPANET, the precursor to today's internet. All right, so that happened in October, just a couple of months after uh, an American walked on the surface of the moon. Uh, I'll give you a bit of detail on this because it'll, I'll come back to it later. The uh, goal of ARPANET at that point was making it possible to remotely use expensive mainframe computers. Right? And the first packet that flowed over ARPANET was the characters L and O, which were the first two letters of the word login. Right, so a, a gentleman at uh, UCLA was trying to log in remotely to a computer at SRI, and after he got to L and O, the network crashed. So there are a set of things that uh, that never change. Right, but but these were both monumental engineering accomplishments that over time have changed our world. And most importantly, and, and NASA is really the poster child for this. They led to a set of aspirations that uh, that kids have and people have for what we can achieve and, uh, and mechanisms for fulfilling those aspirations. And that's what's so important about the space program and I think so important about information technology as well. That is, it, it causes us to aspire to do things, to dream about, uh, about what's possible. Now, computing has an advantage over uh, over aerospace and space travel, and, and that is that we benefit from exponentials. So you're familiar with Moore's Law. If you go back just 20 years, all right, to 1991, the Intel 486 processor had a million transistors, and today's high-end Intel processors have two billion transistors, so a factor of a thousand greater in 20 years, and the number doesn't wet matter. What matters is that it transforms what you can actually do. Right. Similarly, 20 years ago in 1991, there were uh, about half a million uh, users on the internet. That's a lot, but today there are about a billion. So again, a factor of 20 increase, and you get what we call network effects, right? Network effects are that the value of something increases exponentially with the number of people uh, participating in it. Um, so examples of these exponentials, in addition to transistor count and the internet use, uh, is that uh, I'm, I'm told that the computational power that was used to get uh, uh, Apollo spacecraft uh, uh, 20 years ago to, to make them uh, successful is now embodied in a Furby. All right. So, so it's not clear that this is the, the, the greatest social use for that technology, but it's still a remarkable comment on what we've been able to do. So, so let me talk about what's happened in the past 10 years, what's going to happen in the next 10 years, and then how it happens. So, you know, if you think about the things that are totally different today than they were 10 years ago, you've heard already today about digital media. You've heard about mobility, the fact that you're connected to the world no matter where you are by a little device in your pocket. You've heard about social networking. We are using it today via Twitter and other means in this meeting. Uh, but there's search. You know, 10 years ago, you, uh, you, you, you filed things away so that you could maybe or maybe not find them. And today, you just search for them. Scalability, e-commerce, the cloud, all of these are total revolutions in the past 10 years. Looking forward, uh, I think the, the real contribution that we're going to help make in partnership with, uh, with uh, NASA and folks like Christie is putting the smarts in everything. Right? So that's, that's the business computing is in. So when you hear about smart homes or smart cars or smart bodies, I, I always wonder why my body is so much worse instrumented than my car. 
right? When I go to the uh, automobile dealership, they uh, jack a little uh, computer in under the dashboard, read out the parameters from the past six months, figure out what the problem was, and fix it. And when I go into the doctor, she taps me on the knee and sees if it bounces up and asks where it hurts, right? And you, you got to believe there's something that will happen there. Um, uh, you've heard a lot about robotics. NASA has been uh, a, a leader in robotics. And uh, robots, in, in some sense, with the exception of NASA over the past 40 years, have been in what we call structured environments, bolted to factory floors. And NASA has been a pioneer in robots in unstructured environments, where they have to be autonomous and they have to respond to unanticipated situations. You see these in your home today in the, in the person of the Roomba vacuum cleaner. Uh, you see Google's robot cars on the roads of California. Right? And so, so this notion of robots in unstructured environments working with us is going to be transforming over the next 10 years. Uh, you're going to see smart crowds, citizen science, work done here at the University of Washington in this uh, program called Folded. It has hundreds of thousands of people doing protein folding and protein structure calculation as a game. Uh, they were uh, in the news a couple of weeks ago for solving an AIDS-related protein structure problem that had eluded scientists for a decade. And the beauty there is not that just that you're bringing many people to bear on a problem, it's that each of us has unique capabilities, unique strengths, uh, unique things that we can do. And if you can design systems that let people work together, then you uh, can really do something that no collection of identical individuals, much less a single individual, can do. So let me say just a word about how this happens. And again, I think there's a lot of commonality between computing and, uh, and aerospace. There have been a lot of studies about how innovation takes place in computer science. And most importantly, essentially all of the billion-dollar subsectors of today's computing industry trace their roots to federally sponsored research. So the federal government has a really essential role in doing this. And it's a complex ecosystem that involves federal agencies doing research, federal agencies funding research, the university community, and industry R&D. And there's no simple pipeline. People and ideas are constantly moving back and forth. It really is an ecology that, that uh, allows us to be a leader. And we have to maintain that ecology going forward. The interaction of research ideas multiplies the effect. There's an unpredictable period from sort of first idea to billion dollar market. And most interestingly, it, it's often not clear at the outset what the real benefit of an innovation is going to be. When uh, people were working on the internet, ARPANET, nobody was thinking about email or the web or e-commerce or uh, digital media. It was for uh, remotely using expensive mainframe computers. Uh, so, you know, you see this pattern again and again. The final thing I want to touch on is the role of universities in tech transfer. This is something that's commonly misunderstood. Uh, and I think it gets back to this ecosystem notion. The uh, goal of university technology transfer is to put publicly funded innovation to work for the public good. Right? And people have to get over the notion that somehow you're going to float the institutional boat on licensing revenues <laughs> and realize that the goal is to make our nation the world leader and make our regions uh, regions of, uh, of uh, innovation. Uh, so there are very many ways in which universities contribute to innovation. Uh, Explicit technology transfer via licensing is just one of them and by no means the most important. It just gets the most attention. So the bottom line message here is it's an ecosystem. Uh, we have a wonderful one in this region. We have a wonderful one in this nation. It's up to all of us to preserve it and to make sure that the next generation uh, appreciates the, the wonder of discovery that we've been fortunate enough to participate in. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Th thank you so much, Ed. That those were really insightful remarks. So what I'd like to do now is, uh, is open, open the floor to questions. And while folks are coming to the, to the microphone, um, we've, we're receiving questions from, from Twitter as, as we go along. And we received one um, from Matt, Matt Moffitt on, on Twitter who asked about space applications for robotic nanotechnology. So he's interested, he's interested in, the, in, the, in the tiny robots. And I was wondering if uh, perhaps Christy might want to take a, a crack at that or someone else on the panel to talk a little bit about space applications for robotic nanotechnology. Sure, I'm happy to start, although um, I will say I'm not an expert in uh, nanotechnology. I tend to work on a slightly larger scale than that. Um, so 
what I can say about it, there's uh, a number of things going on. So there are projects called CubeSats that are being worked on um, by a number of people. So those are not nanotechnology. They're, um, I'm actually not sure of the exact dimensions, but they're usually, you know, bread box size. Yeah, two or three kilograms. 10 yeah. centimeters. 10, 10, 10 centimeters, okay. Uh, so that's one area. I think some of the limits with going smaller that, than that in space applications are what are you trying to do? So if you... Um, have actuation limits, so you need to have enough power to move or um, actually accomplish something in terms of manipulating the environment. They tend to need to be a larger scale. Um, so achievements in that area, like I said, there's the CubeSats. There are also a number of things going on in um, air environments in the Earth, so small flying things. And um, people are also looking at, at getting medical robotics inside of people on that scale as well. Maybe. I could comment on the applications of robotics and the kinds of things that I was talking about. Uh, Pre-positioning cargo and putting habitats in place and maybe starting in situ uh, propellant production, those kinds of things will require highly autonomous systems, uh, robots, to go do those things. And so I think it's, it's an essential piece of uh, an affordable uh, space exploration program. I think, with, you know, as Ed was saying, computer science is absolutely integral to everything that we're going to try to do. <laughs> Great. Th thanks very much. Um, I, I must say that I've, I've envisioned many questions that I'd like to ask of Bill Nye, the science guy, but I never... <laughs> I never imagined that we might be taking a question from Bill Nye, <laughs> the science guy. So uh, in a bit of a role reversal, please, Bill. Uh, how much are you all working on what I'm going to call biofuels? These would be f renewable fuels. And it seems to me uh, not just uh, I'd like to know what NASA's doing. I'd like to know what uh, distributed computers doing. And uh, I'm very interested to hear with the Museum of Flight if there's any plans to have a renewable fuel uh, display here. I'm imagining algae, algae that's been genetically modified to produce uh, kerosene or something akin to that uh, versus um, swamp gas. And then in closing, I have another question about efficiency. Is there, is there really a good reason that that door is open? <laughs> uh, I'm not kidding. Uh, uh, it seems I feel cold air coming in. I see natural light, which of course is unsettling. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I hear a lot of noise that you guys have to overcome. So uh, this to me, I think if I understand it, biofuels would be part of the future for national security reasons, but also for this fundamental bigger idea, uh, especially in space exploration, we have to do more with less. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing your answers. Thanks, Bill. Bob, pl uh, please take a, take a crack at the uh, discussion on biofuels. Yeah, I think, I'm not sure I can answer the, the door issue, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, on the uh, at least on the on the aviation side. So so NASA is working in partnership with DoD, FAA, and industry on the 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 overall um, life cycle issues associated with biofuels. So. The, the piece that we're working on, that NASA's working on, is, is the characterization of those fuels um, in the engines, in the systems, and so forth. So um, others are, are working more of the, the, the development of the, the fuels themselves, and, and, and the, uh, especially the DOE and, and so forth, and the, and the scaling of those and, and the production. But, but one of the key issues in aviation is the the, you got to be able to drop, basically we call it drop-in fuels, you got to be able to drop the fuel and you got to be able to use current systems. So we have to characterize, make sure that the, that all the seals, um, you know, are, are, are going to be, are going to keep their integrity, that, that the emission, the other aspects of emissions are, are well characterized, that we get the same level of performance and so forth. So we are in a, in a, a really tight partnership with the other government agencies and industry in doing that. And, and, you know, a lot of progress is being made. We've, we've had a couple of, um, of uh, campaigns already, ground campaigns, where we put it onto a couple of vehicles that we have. We've d done this out at the Dryden Race Flight Research Center, and and basically looked at the what's coming out the tailpipe. We're we're um, we haven't done it yet, but we are looking at doing a, a flight campaign as well. So actually taking up flying these, and then and then having other aircraft in trail, um, absor you know, collecting the uh, um, the exhaust so that we can measure it in, in flight as well. So so we are we're quite active in that arena. 
From a space exploration perspective, it's a fascinating question. I, I'm not aware of any, uh, any particular work that's directly asking that question, uh, other than uh, some interesting work on uh, agri what the potential for growing plants and algae, for example, that would be used to make fuels on Mars. And there are some very early preliminary studies being done to ask how would you set up a uh, greenhouse on Mars that might enable, for example, the in situ uh, production of some of those uh, some of those fuels, for example. That certainly hasn't been the focus. It's been food, uh, food and oxygen, or has been the focus so far from an exploration perspective. But we'll, uh, I would imagine that we'll be leveraging what the aircraft industry does uh, in that in that case. Great. Thanks, Roger. Yeah. Six more questions. Okay. Good. Uh, Reese Lumsden, space enthusiast. Um, my question kind of is predicated on your earlier comments, Joe, and actually it's for the whole panel, however. I, I kind of find it a little bit ironic that what we, when we talk about NASA and what's held up as the kind of strategic element of NASA being the space shuttle, as I'm sure most of you on the panel know, but probably most people don't know, is predicated on 1960s and 70s design, mm -hmm. 80s technology. So it's kind of ironic, obviously, that we're talking about innovation and technological advancement, and yet the the, the centerpiece of NASA was the space shuttle, which is obviously very old technology. But I think it gets into what you were talking about, Dr. Myers, about how incredibly long it takes to, um, to have hardware in space. And I think that kind of hints at where we perhaps need to broaden our definition of innovation, not just to mm -hmm. focus on technology, but all those, also those things that enable technology. I would suggest, and I'm sure most of the panelists here have, have probably heard this argument time and time again, that if we were to see innovation in our export control and regulatory regime that would immensely um, expand and, and forward our space economy, in inverted commas, because I guess we don't really have a space economy. Um, but it kind of also hints on something that also all the panelists, I'm sure, are aware of, this idea of, of tech push versus need pull. Mm. Um, jump across to the pharmaceuticals industry and you see that um, there's certainly a lot of money the pharmaceuticals are pushing into drugs for diabetes, drugs for heart disease, and dare I say it, drugs for male impotence. Why do they do that? It's because there's an increasingly never-present need for it from the market basis. And so I guess my question after all that is, how, do, how are we going to balance tech push versus a market pull when for space we don't really have a market. I would suggest that if we suddenly found a colony on Mars, we would see um, uh, launch system development uh, increase, or certainly the money to go to launch system development increase rather rapidly. Thanks. One, one, one quick remark. I, sometimes I'm, I'm approached by um, people who ask me why, why NASA is um, covering up evidence of life on Mars. And I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by that question because in, if we were to find life on Mars, what would that do to NASA's budget? It would skyrocket. <laughs> and so we, if, if, there's, if there's life there, we're, we're very interested in finding it and we're very interested in getting the word out. So um, I innovation is a, is, a, is a fascinating thing. You, you, you mentioned this notion that the space shuttle is actually taking advantage of 60s and 70s technology and, and yet it's, it's held up as, as one of the, the great technological achievements of, of recent time. One of the reasons why we're not in a position today to send humans beyond the moon and onto asteroids and, and, and Mars is we don't actually have the technologies in hand to accomplish that. And so that what we're doing at NASA now is trying to develop the technologies to enable these incredible missions. So today's technologies become tomorrow's missions and the real question is how do you shorten that life cycle so that you're not having to wait 20 years from the advent of a technology to when it can actually be, be implemented. That, that is a, a huge, huge challenge that we're, that we're trying to face. Um, I wonder if any of my, my colleagues would like to talk about this interplay between push and pull in, in technology. And once we, we do that, we'll, we'll go to our next question. We have about another 10 minutes, and I see several people waiting in line, so I'd really love to be able to get to all of your questions if we can. Well, so I can say something about the technology push and pull. I mean, I think it's something, I don't think that there's a, an algorithm that we have for optimizing that right now, but I think it's something that uh, you don't want to suppress either side of it. Mm -hmm. I think that there needs to be the driving uh, 
you know, questions from the funding agencies that say, you know, we definitely want people looking at these particular problems to solve, but you also need to be engaging the general population in terms of what do they want and, you know, given, make sure that they're aware of the latest innovations and then just see where they take them. Because I, I think you just don't have any way of necessarily predicting and you shouldn't. Um, so I, I don't know that there's a, a fixed answer to that other than we need to have activity on both sides mm -hmm. and actively engage it. Great. Thanks. Uh, Dave Anderson, retired Boeing, product development. Uh, mine is an easy question. I believe there are still discoveries to be developed that benefit commercial air transportation. My interest primarily is in aeronautics, but I know that can be linked to space exploration and even underwater exploration. NASA has had an interest in understanding the physics of flying through atmospheres other than Earth's, mm -hmm. so that when we get there, we can move fast. Can you tell us about that interest and progress? Uh, let me let me take a crack at that. For, first of all, let me confess to my my greatest life dream is to pilot an aircraft in the uh, in the atmosphere of Mars. That would for me be completely fulfilling. So I've been looking at at this technical challenge. We've we've approached it from a, a couple of different perspectives at, at NASA with with mission with mission concepts, some of which are, are looking at flying in very rarefied atmospheres like the one we have in in Mars. The Mars atmosphere at at, at the surface of Mars is roughly equivalent to 100,000 feet at Earth. So you can imagine mm -hmm. aircraft flying on Mars that look like our very high altitude aircraft like the, like the U-2, or might perhaps look more like rockets that, that are not depending on lifting surfaces to, uh, to achieve their, their flight. We're also looking at, at operations in atmospheres in other places like in Titan, uh, the moon of Saturn, and it has a, a fascinating atmosphere that's much more dense than, than the one I just mentioned at Mars. And it turns out that balloons are, are uh, one of the more optimal systems for exploring around Titan to find some uh, perhaps biological precursors for, for life that we've only found as, as, um, as organic compounds or evidence of organic compounds now, and we're wondering what, what might be there next. So. Um, Aerial uh, atmospheric flight in planetary exploration is a, is a very rich research area at NASA, and we're looking to take the next steps in, in actual mission concepts for how we might execute some of those, some of those missions in the future. Thank you. Uh, Ryan Lobsher, Odysseus Technologies. Uh, Roger uh, Myers outlined all the technologies that are available for in-space propulsion. But what about the hard part, which is from the surface of the Earth to low Earth orbit? So my question to the panel is, what do you think the next new paradigm for the propulsion from the surface of the Earth to low Earth orbit is going to be? Roger, would you take that? Sure. Uh, when you say new paradigm, I mean that we've done studies of beamed power launches, we've done uh, air launch, air launch uh, in fact, Virgin Galactic is going to do air launch. There are various different architectures. Um, I, I, I hesitate to say, you know, it's the next new paradigm. You know, one of the, the messages I tried to convey is it, it's ta it takes a long time to transition technologies. And, you know, if we look at what uh, SpaceX, for example, have done, ha has done, they have dramatically reduced the cost of launch by focusing on how to build uh, less complex vehicles. And so they didn't, re I mean, you could say, oh, they, uh, they went to old technology, but look at the cost reduction that they have enabled by actually, in some sense, using older technology and focusing instead on the manufacturing flow and the way that they, the way that they build their, their systems. So it's hard to predict what the next new paradigm is going to be. I, I know there's a, there's a program that the uh, Office of the Chief Technologist is funding now on uh, beam, Ride the Light. It's a beamed power uh, uh, system. And actually, we're, we're doing one of those studies. You know, frankly, uh, the state of the art of laser technology, even looking out uh, 10 or 20 years, makes me personally concerned about the real feasibility of, of that architecture. So. I'm not sure that, um, that we're going to see huge differences in terms of a paradigm shift in launch technology, just given the reality of, of 
how much energy it does take. I will say that I, take, I, I do take some exception to your characterization of launch as the hard part. Look at the total mission and the energy balance of the whole mission, and you will find that actually you need to do both. You can't say that one is necessarily harder than the other. We're focused on launch now with the commercial crew and the COTS programs that we heard about before and the SLS because that's where we are. But if we want to go beyond LEO, look at the total energy and you will see you need to do both uh, a, an, a very effective job at getting affordable systems in both areas. Okay. Thanks, Roger. We have about five minutes left, and I'd like to sort of go to the lightning round of <laughs> questions, <laughs> questions and answers. So if you could be as succinct as possible, and we'll try to do the same. I'll do my best. Uh, Meredith Anderson, flight test at Boeing. Um, the panel mentioned two technologies, blended wing body and pilot on the ground technologies, that uh, the, the technological side exists, but there's a, a human factor challenge. Um, and that's really hard for industry to break through. Is there any sort of national, international, social networking campaign to uh, help with the human perception side of things? Yes, so let's see, lightning round. So, so um, getting, you're absolutely right, big issue. The, the history has been uh, for a new configuration like that, we, we, we look to try to partner with the, the military, with the DOD, to see if they've got a, a mission that, that works, mature it there, and then transition it to, to the civil sector. And, and honestly, for things like hybrid wing body and things like that, I see the same. I think we got to look there. we got to see if we can make that work with the military because that's the best way to get these things in full scale and get them out and then get some experience and then transition them to the civil sector. Yeah, my name is Bruce Pittman from NASA Ames. I, I guess the question I'd like to ask is following up on Lori Garver's comments about the, the difficulty of bringing new technology in the battle between the past and the future in, in aerospace. And I guess my question for the panel is why has it been easier to do that in other industries like personal computers and, and, uh, and software and so much more difficult in in aerospace to, to make these technological advancements and, and, and evolve the, uh, the technology, and is there anything that we can do about it to, to enhance that? Two, two words, Bruce, risk tolerance. Uh, my name is <laughs> <laughs> I would also say profit motive. <laughs> right on point for me. My name is Gene McBrayer. I'm a trustee of the Museum of, Museum of Flight a private pilot on an experimental aircraft builder, so I can identify with, uh, with Joseph about that and his brother. Uh, I'm also uh, interested, have been my entire career, in economic energy solutions, underscore economic. And I'm impressed with how uneconomic many of our forward-looking solu forward solutions are today. I'd like to ask you about some technology that I know NASA developed at least a decade ago, the concept of putting in geostationary uh, orbit around the equator, arrays of photovoltaic cells, where it maximizes the efficiency of the photovoltaics we have today and beams it back to Earth with demonstrated microwave technology. Uh, the study I saw, the studies I saw said that the, the physics is clearly there, the efficiencies are there except for one thing, the economies of putting that much material in space to create those arrays. When are we going to get Moore's law to work on that? If we could solve that problem, I honestly believe we have a long range energy solution that would produce enough electricity to replace all of the other options uh, by the 21st century. What are your comments on that? Well, one of the things that I would say is that putting things in geosynchronous orbit takes twice the, you, the typical spacecraft that is launched to geosynchronous orbit is half propellant. And that's if you launch into geosynchronous transfer orbit. If you launch to low Earth orbit, which is the lowest cost place to launch to, it's, it's, a lot, it's even more. So you're launching mostly fuel, which does not make power, right? It doesn't create revenue. And so one of the things that we really have to do is invest in systems, and I'm sorry, but in space propulsion systems, <laughs> to get the, cost, the total mass that you have to get to low Earth orbit down to the point where you're not paying for these enormous, unique rockets. 
in order to get those space power systems to geo. If you can shrink the architecture, make it more affordable, use rockets that aren't unique to that one application, but instead the DOD might use commercial industry and then they launch CompSats. If you can distribute those fixed costs, now we're, stock, we're talking about really changing the economics of space travel. And that's kind of exciting to me personally. Great. Sorry, that was not a lightning round. <laughs> uh, I, think I think we have time for just one more question. Uh, Lloyd McCracken, and a uh, question uh, on uh, manned sp space flight. Um, we've been in low Earth orbit, and we've experienced long periods of time up there, but the big challenge to go to the moon, Mars, anything, is getting outside of the protective envelope of the Earth. Once we get outside that, we're exposed mm -hmm to radiation and the human factor. We can send ro robots all day long. It's the human factor. How are we working on shielding to really protect humans to be able to actually venture outside low Earth orbit? Thank you for, for raising that because um, it, it, is, it is actually ironic that when I talk with my colleagues at the Johnson Space Center in Houston and ask them what do they think are the biggest technological challenges to going beyond the moon, they, they talk about radiation and they talk about psychology. Group psychology on these extremely long missions could be one of the, the biggest challenges that we face. But let me come back to the point of, of radiation and talk about some fascinating new technologies that we're looking at. One method of, of shielding for, for radiation is to put large, heavy things in between you and what you're afraid of. That might be water, that might be lead, it depends on the, on the style of, of the threat. One thing that we're looking at at NASA is making magnetospheric uh, spheres, shields, if you will, that weigh nothing and require only power to achieve that help to block radiation coming in uh, that would be a risk to the crew and, and to the avionics on, on a spacecraft. And this is one of, one of the ideas that has come through our, our NIAC program, NASA Institute for Advanced Concepts, uh, NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts now is the, the name of the program. And we're looking at these really advanced ideas for trying to address issues like, like radiation. And I think that we may have some breakthroughs on this in the next 10 years or so, but it's at very low technology readiness right now, and we've only come to really appreciate the challenge that, that we're facing, not solving this problem with, with heavy, massive things, but much cleverer ideas that achieve the same, same end. So I think, uh, I think that brings the, the, our panel discussion on innovation to a conclusion. I'd really like to, to thank my, my colleagues, Bob, Christy, Roger, Ed, for their very insightful comments. And thank you, the audience, for your, your wonderful thoughts and ideas. And um, please keep the discussion going. And let's keep paving our, our way to, to a better future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe, and our panel. That was great. Uh, 